So just for Emmanuel, since you missed our first hymn, you got to look up number 296 in our book. It's the first hymn. It was kind of about you a little bit. <laughs> 296, you got to look at it. Okay, so our exhortation this morning is an interesting title, The Sad Story of Samson. Hmm. That sounds kind of sad. So let's read from Hebrews 11, and we'll see how sad this ends up being. Hebrews 11, verse 32 through 40. Hebrews 11, verse 32 through 40. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, and put foreign ar armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, in order that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So, with that, our exhortation is the sad story of Samson. Well, good morning. Um, Samson's a character, I guess I revisit off and on. I, I kind of like his story, uh, but it's a uh, puzzling one to me at times. It's, it's one of those I'm not sure why it's in the Bible, why God did things this way. Sometimes I've uh, talked to our uh, son Alex about well, I was talking to him the other day about the Bible and how it's different from other books and how there's not really, um, you know, super fantastic stories in there. I mean, there's miraculous things that happen in the Bible, but it's not like Greek mythology and things like that. And he said, well, what about Samson? Hmm, I guess that is a little bit different than uh, most of the stories in the Bible because Samson is like a superhero, right? He's got super strength. Uh, and it's just a kind of an odd story in the, in the Bible. And I think uh, Samson, and, and you may disagree, but I think he's an uh, often judged character. He's maybe one of the most judged characters uh, in the Bible. <coughs> And uh, you just think of him and think how you might judge Samson. And I think some of the issues are, uh, was he uh, self-centered, self-indulgent uh, type person? Did he have a weakness for women? Um, some people judge him on that. Did he, he use this great strength wisely? I don't know. Do you have issues with Samson? Can you think of anything I missed about this man, what he might be judged on uh, from the story in the Bible? 
Yeah, th there might be other things, but those are the main ones, I would think. But uh, we're told to judge not. Um, and I kind of wonder if in his day these were the same things that were happening to him. But in fact, Samson was a judge. Um, he was there to judge the people. It says that in times of trouble, God would raise up men to deliver Israel from their enemies. And in this case, it was Samson. So he was a judge. And he was something of a miracle child. It says his uh, uh, mother was barren uh, before she had Samson. So it doesn't say that she was old or anything, but uh, you would have to assume that once they come to the conclusion that a woman is barren, she must be a little bit old. Um, uh, but she's told she's going to have a child, and this child is going to be special. So let's turn to Judges so we can get an idea of what's going on in this man's life. Uh, Judges 13. <clears throat> um, in verse 5, it says, For lo, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from birth. And he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So we have a little declaration. This is by an angel of God to, uh, uh, well, let's see. What's her name? It's Manoah and his wife. So um, she's told that she is going to have a child, and he's going to be a judge of Israel. And... His mission is to begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So my first question to you is, did he accomplish his mission in his life? As, yeah, I'd say yes. He began to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Uh, so when we look at his life overall and we say, well, he did accomplish that mission. He is mentioned in Hebrews along with, uh, uh, in that passage, Dan read, there's a few other judges mentioned there uh, briefly. And it says he did what he was asked to do and he's uh, listed as a faithful servant of God. And so my question to myself especially is, why do I go through all these judgment things on Samson? And I, I think maybe that is the whole point of Samson's story, is to make us look at ourselves and see if we look at this story of this man, uh, how we view him. And you notice in the story of Samson that no one ever says to him, do you need some help, Samson? You know. He's on his own. Uh, there's no one that ever comes up and uh, says to him, boy, you're doing great things here. How would you like some help with that? I, I think the comments, and maybe you've heard these in your own life, is, well, maybe he just likes doing it by himself. Maybe he's uh, suited for this work and no one else is. But I think the whole point of Samson's life, and maybe ours as well, is he's trying to get Israel to sever themselves from the Philistines, um, from their whole way of life, from their whole way of thinking. So did he accomplish that? Well, he began to, it says. He began to uh, accomplish that, to... Uh, 
uh, free to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Is Israel de uh, delivered from the Philistines today? I would say not, not quite yet. Um, so what he has begun has had some kind of end. I'd say in David's time, there was kind of an end to the Philistines, but they seem to pop back up all the time. Uh, and you never can quite sever yourself from the Philistines or the Palestinians of uh, today. They still hang around. They still call it, um, cause problems. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so we have this man, Samson. He's going to be a judge for 20 years in Israel. Um, so what is his plan to deliver Israel? Well, I'll ask you that. What is his plan to deliver Israel? How is he going to do it? Yeah, but he comes up with a plan, wh and what is that plan? Right, he's going to marry a Philistine. That's a kind of a weird plan, right? It, it seems like a weird plan. Let's look at some of the other judges and, and what they heard from God. Let's just turn to Judges 4. And in verse 6, this is uh, Deborah and Barak. It says, She, Deborah, sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedish in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Now that seems like a plan. I mean, here you got an army. You have God speaking through Deborah and saying, here's what I want you to do. Get your army together from these two tribes. Uh, meet Sisera, the general of uh, Jabin and do battle, and you're you will win. That's a plan. How about uh, Judges seven two? <coughs> Excuse me, a familiar passage with uh, Gideon. It says, "The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand." lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has delivered me. Now therefore proclaim in the ear ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. And Gideon tested them. 22,000 returned, and 10,000 remained. And we know it goes on from there, and it, the army gets smaller and smaller. But that's, that's the kind of plan you can relate to, right? That... If you've got armies going against each other and they're going to do battle. Um, this is the kind of thing the judges usually do. Uh, let's just look at one more in Judges 11 with Jephthah when he was raised up as a judge, as a uh, savior for Israel. In verse 1 it says, Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. So, and also verse uh, 29 of Judges 11. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And then he does battle and the Ammonites are defeated, and uh, God delivers Israel through the judge. These are the kind of things you can relate to, right? That's a plan. When you get your armies together, whether small or big, 
and you know God's behind you, and then you do battle, and you see God victorious. And this plan of Samson's is very odd, to marry a Philistine, and it causes his parents to be concerned, and probably everybody else in the nation. But he says, <coughs> get her, for she pleases me. Um, what is this plan that he has then? And it says th that his parents did not know that uh, this was God's uh, intent uh, back in Judges. So why is this one different? Why, why do you have this guy with this super strength, yet he's going to have a plan of, um, well, it's different. It's not an army. He's not going to lead an army to battle against uh, the Philistine. And I think, again, it's to make the people of Israel make a decision about what's going on. Uh, I think, for one, it's, it's meant to expose the culture of the Philistines. You know, Samson was going to do everything right, uh, I think. And he, he says to his parents, I want you to set up this marriage. Uh, so he's... It's w whatever the Philistines tell you to do, you do that. Uh, so he did everything right. But I think, uh, and we'll, we'll just go briefly through each section of this, that it's even when you do everything right with the Philistines, it ends up bad because they'll deal treacherously with you, no matter. And this, um, this woman that he arranges uh, to be married to, that his parents arrange to be married to, she ends up dead uh, because of the Philistines um, and their brutality. <coughs> and even uh, before she's killed, um, she's given to another man. So Samson's whole episodes with them, and he, he kills uh, a lot of people during this episode with this wife that uh, he arranges to marry, it does not go well. Um, and it's mainly because of how the Philistines act. And I think all of Israel should have seen this then and said, uh, these people cannot be trusted. And they are definitely our enemies. But what happened was 3,000 men of Judah came down to get Samson and turn him over to the Philistines. Well, what happens is Samson says, fine, you can bind me and give me to the Philistines. Just don't kill me uh, yourselves. And what he ends up doing and then, as we know, is taking the jawbone of an ass and killing a thousand uh, men of the Philistines. What happened to these 3,000 men of Judah then that came to get him? Did they line up behind Samson and say, my goodness, this man's a, you know, he's a, a leader. He could lead us to victory. If he can kill 1,000 men by himself, surely with the help of 3,000 men, we could conquer Philistia. But that doesn't happen. Uh, instead, you know, the people think, why are you raising up the ire of these Philistines? Um, so they don't get behind him. They leave him on his own. Um, <coughs> so looking back at that whole situation, I think our tendency is to focus on the whole marriage to the Philistine woman when instead maybe it should be you know why didn't Israel help him out here well, uh, what, what's the matter with this nation that um, did not get behind this judge of Israel why did they leave him on his own I mean yes he killed a thousand men but can you go on like that 
even in that episode, it says he, he got so thirsty afterward he thought he was going to die. And he had to plead to God for help uh, to get water. He said, I, or otherwise I'm going to, you know, what was the point of all this if I'm just going to die of thirst? And I think that's a point about Samson too. You know, he, he wasn't a superhero. He was just a man that was given uh, special abilities when uh, the Spirit of God came upon him. And I don't even know if he looked uh, particularly special. Because otherwise, why would they ask him, where, where do you get your strength? And he could have just said, why, can't you just look at me? You know, I, I've got extreme muscles. But I, I doubt that he did. Um, so they had to ask him, where do you get this strength? Good. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, he might have been, but uh, obviously the things that he did were far beyond what normal men can do. So they had to ask, you know, you, you're just a man. How can you do these things? But um, no followers. And maybe it's for the same reason people focused on his marriage to this Philistine woman and said, I, I think that's wrong. I, I don't know why he's doing that. And, um, you know, when the fantastic things right in front of their eyes, this t guy picked up a bone, a jawbone of an ass, and killed a thousand men with it. Why don't you focus on that, you would wonder. Now, the next little episode is uh, the harlot at Gaza. So again, I, I shouldn't even say that because to me, the main focus of this story is that he ripped the gate off a city and carried it for miles to another city. So he um, goes to Gaza and it would be risky to go there, right? They're already after him. They don't like Samson, the Philistines. But it says that he goes there and he sees a harlot and he stays overnight with her. And now the men of the area find out about it and they're waiting outside the gate. They say, look, as soon as he steps outside the gate, we'll get him. <coughs> but instead, you know, and it must have been a startling thing. He comes to the gate and just rips it off its hinges and, and takes the whole thing, the whole city gate. We're not talking about a little garden gate or anything. This is a big city gate where people come and go. And he just rips it out and carries it for miles to a hill outside of Hebron and just sticks it there. So I, I'm just guessing the people of Hebron get up in the morning and look up on the hill and say, what's this? You know, what's, what's going on here? There's a gate out there. And then, you know, eventually the whole story uh, comes to them that Samson has ripped the gate uh, from Hebron and carried it. I, I don't know how many miles that is, but Gaza's by the coast and Hebron's a little south of uh, Jerusalem, inland more. So that's a lot of miles to be carrying this big gate uh, on your shoulders. And, and I'm, I'm just guessing that once the story was told, the people would have said, he stayed with the harlot? You know, oh, oh, there's this big gate outside the city. Yeah, yeah, I see that, but he stayed with a harlot? It kind of reminds me of John uh, 9. Uh, this is the man born blind. <coughs> And it says, uh, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. 
He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. I wonder if that's what happened with Samson as well. That they say, one thing we know, this guy's a sinner. You know, look at all the things he's done. Um, can you think of other people that have stayed with harlots that were not sinners? Yeah, and spies stayed with Rahab, right? But their purpose was not uh, to stay with a harlot. And I, I have no idea whether that was Samson's purpose or not. But I do know that he went to a city that was very risky for him to go to. And one of the things that he did was rip the gate off that city uh, and bring it to Hebron. And I'm guessing to show them, you know, the, the gate's open. Um, what are you waiting for? And it also reminds me of Jesus who, you know, they said, aside from what uh, they said to the man born blind is that he eats with sinners. You know, he eats with them. Uh, he carries on with them. There's sinners hanging around him. There's sinners talking to him. There's certainly prostitutes there. We know there's tax collectors, the despised tax collectors hanging around Jesus. Surely he is a sinner. We've seen these people with him. So it's guilt by association. And again, maybe Samson did uh, have a problem going into this harlot. But I think that, that, again, that's part of the issue with Samson is to look at his life and say, what are you going to focus on here? Um, the things that he did that are positive or the things that you were um, – judging him on that appear to be negative. And finally, there's the story with Delilah. Yeah, we know he was a judge for 20 years, and we don't know when these various episodes happened uh, during his 20-year uh, uh, rule as a judge. But this is definitely at the end, right? This is at the end of his uh, time of judging. So after 20 years, he finds a woman, and he says he loves, it says he loves her. Samson has no family, right? Uh, the woman he was supposed to marry, he never had any relationship with her at all. There was never any honeymoon with her. Uh, by the time uh, she was dead, he, he never was truly married to her. He, um, she was given to another man before they were actually uh, man and wife in, in all senses. And whether you think what happened at the prostitutes, uh, the harlot's house, uh, whatever happened there it was surely just one night. So there are two women that uh, in his life, and it's hard to say that he really had a weakness for women. But this one, Delilah, is the one he loves, it says. Um, so after 20 years of being a judge, he finds someone that he loves. And maybe he's thinking, this is the time now that I will start my family. And again, I'm not sure who, we, we don't have much background on Delilah, so you kind of have to guess uh, who she is. But it, it seems like she might have been an Israelite and that these um, Philistine men uh, find a way, find out that she is the love of Samson's life and figure out a way to bribe her. So how do you view this episode with Delilah and Samson? You might say, well, here we go again. Samson, once again, blinded by his own desires, 
uh, he was unable to see this treachery that was going to happen because you know he was blinded and uh, in the end he is blinded you know so maybe that's a signal of uh, from God uh, telling him that his problems in his life I don't know. Did Samson tell a secret he shouldn't have told? Uh, you know, that's, a, again, a perspective you, you might have. Should he have really told her where his strength lie? She obviously was testing him all the time. Each time he told her, uh, you know, this is how I uh, receive my strength, and if you did this to me, um, if you bound me with uh, these cords, then th that would I couldn't get out of that. And each time he showed her, yes, I can, see? You know, I can break cords, I can do whatever. So you'd think that would be impressive enough for even a treacherous person, a uh, person that's going to betray uh, someone else to say, wait a minute, you know, <coughs> should I be doing this? Yeah, should I? Look at this guy. He, he does have super strength. Where does he get this? But no, she doesn't say that She to herself. She continues to try to get him to tell it so sh that she could betray him. So was it wrong for Samson to say finally, my strength is in my hair, or I think it's in his fowl that he made, or really his mother made since birth, and he kept it. Uh, he kept it as well. And I think if you look at Judas in, in Jesus' life, should Jesus not have told Judas all the things that he did? Um, uh, Judas eventually figured out where Jesus was going to be so he could betray him. And Jesus himself said, go do what you have to do. Um, And that, uh, and I, again, I think the point is Samson did what you have to do. Um, if there's someone you love, you have to tell them where your strength lies. <coughs> and Samson would not have cut his own hair, right? He wouldn't have. That was a commitment he kept for his whole life. But he couldn't stop someone else from cutting his hair, uh, someone that he loved. So I don't know. You, again, you have to think of what your focus is on. Was it wrong for him to tell her this? Or was it right for him to reveal where his strength lay and let her make whatever decision uh, she wanted to make? Maybe it was right because then he would truly find out uh, if she was faithful to him or not. And she wasn't. Uh, she was very treacherous. And, and you know, he, w he was hauled out and made sport of by the Philistines. So then in his death, uh, it says he, he slew more people than he did in his life. And just one more thing that I think about in terms of Samson, and I think he, he's criticized for, is that uh, at the end of his life, he's, he says, I, I would, he prays to God and says, if you give me vengeance for my eyes. And I think people say, well, that's a little bit selfish as well, that he would ask for that. But I think part of it is, and again, you know, it, it just depends on how you look at it. When I, I think he wanted to make sure that in his death, you know, he did all the right things. The, the, in the law, what was the retribution for an eye being poked out? It would be for the other person's eye to be poked out, right? An eye for an eye. Um, 
So I don't really think he's asking for that. I think he's saying, I can't see anymore. I, I can't do, it, I'm not going to be a judge anymore. He knows that. You know, his life's going to end uh, shortly. So I think he's saying, God, guide me to the best spot where I can kill these Philistines. You know, that sounds brutal, I guess, but I think that's what he's saying, that, you know, I don't have an eyes. I, I'm not going to be able to uh, do much anymore here. So please, if you want vengeance on these Philistines, get me to the right spot uh, to do this. <coughs> And remember, the lad led him uh, prior to his prayer to um, the spot. And it was two big columns that were holding up the whole uh, temple area, holding up a roof or uh, something. And, you know, that was the right spot. He killed uh, thousands of Philistines that day. So it is a sad life that this man had, you know, a sad life. No, he was alone this whole life. Nobody followed him. It wasn't like Gideon where he had, you know, people pretty much worshipped Gideon by the time he was uh, finished as judge. Uh, he's not like any other of the judges. The, he is one that gets judged an awful lot. Uh, So that's my question for us then. Um, how do we view this man? And maybe it says something about the way we act in our lives. Are we critical and fault finding? Um, and as I said earlier, the people of Israel are still dealing with the Philistines, uh, trying to get them out of their lives, trying to get their, inf their the influence of the Palestinians out of their lives, and they just can't do it. You know, because there's, I don't know, I, maybe they don't believe that they're as bad as they are, or um, maybe they believe that they can make peace with them. But I wonder sometime if we as believers are doing the same thing. We just can't quite seem to get these Philistines out of our lives. Um, we do have a savior already we know we have this man uh, Jesus um, but I wonder sometimes if we don't get behind the little saviors that come along you know just like uh, Paul and Peter after Jesus came along and people got behind them um, do we find things to criticize about people that are actually trying to do God's will, but we say, no, I know that person's a sinner. I'm not going to get behind what they do. Uh, and maybe it's not sinner so much as you think the other person has character flaws. <coughs> so you would not get behind them, even though they're doing maybe a, not such a mighty deed as Samson, but a deed in service to God and sometimes we just don't get behind them and help them out. Why not? Is it because we're so great that we can pick and choose who, who should get our help? Well, truly there's only one that overcame and we know that Jesus was not a sinner even though uh, people claim that he was. And he himself, well, he did it by himself. No one helped him. And would he have liked help? Um, well, his ultimate job, n no one could do but him. But yeah, I think he would have liked help. <coughs> he would have liked to hear people say, yeah, no matter what happens, which Peter said, you know, I'll be behind you. There's no way anybody's going to get between me and you. But they did. Um, so 
so Jesus was by himself, and he only had the Father to help him. But I think this is our chance now to say, you know, every time that we take the bread and the wine, we say, we're behind you. This is, you know, we're going to carry on uh, what you started. <coughs> Not that we could do it as well. Not that um, we have all the best ideas and, and carry things out in the best ways. But we, were, we are going to get behind Jesus and make our commitment to him. So that is what I'm hoping we'll do today, that we're going to say, you know, like in the case of, of Samson, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but I know he did some good things, and I would get behind those things if he were here today. And we do have a chance to do it with Jesus, and we have a chance to do it with our brothers and sisters that we can get behind them. So really, is it a sad story of Samson? Um, because he's mentioned in Hebrews 11, the end of Samson is not sad, right? He'll be in the kingdom. Uh, and that's the time, I think, if, if we pursue this rightly, that we can ask him you know, did you have problems in your life? And you, not that it matters at this point. Uh, and it would be great to, to hear what his answers are. But in the meantime, I would say, uh, let's follow men like Samson and especially men like our Savior Jesus so that we can as well have not a sad story but a happy ending. Thanks, Trent. You reminded me of this verse that you might agree with or might not. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the fiery hell. Well, to me, that's all about Samson. To me, he was a sinner with his eyes, and when they were taken from him, he recovered and repented and overcame, and he will be in the kingdom, as Trent said. So perhaps that's about him, perhaps not, but, but there it is. So sad story of Samson as a happy ending in some ways. Some ways not, some ways yes. All right, with that thought, let's continue with uh, hymn number 218. In number 218, loving shepherd of thy sheep, keep thy lambs in safety keep. Nothing can thy power withstand, none can pluck them from thy hand. Number 218.
There's another passage in the Gospels that Samson reminded me of. Here's how it goes. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kedron, where there was a garden, into which he himself entered with his, with his disciples. This is John 18. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place where Jesus had often met with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. When, therefore, he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. That's the verse that Samson reminded me of. At this point in Jesus' ministry, people of authority, they respected Jesus enough to think that he's a superhero, just like Samson. 